You may be familiar with Stalin's terror in the 1930s, also known as the Great Terror, the Great Purge. But have you ever heard of the Red Terror, which occurred in 1918? The Bolsheviks had seized power in Petrograd, Moscow, and other key Russian cities late 1917. They later signed the Brest-Litovsk Treaty with the Central Powers, which pulled them out of the war. But then they unleashed the terror to their own population. Why was this? What happened? How many people were killed? You will find out in this video. I'm going to talk about the Red Terror. Hey, welcome back on the channel and welcome to another episode of Revolutionary Russia. If you're new to this channel, I'm Stefan, I'm a Dutch history teacher and I make videos about history for you. If you find it interesting, consider subscribing and also hit that notification bell. March 1918, the Bolsheviks signed the peace treaty of Brest-Litovsk with the Central Powers and this pulled them out of the First World War. As a result of this, Russia, or rather called Soviet Russia, had to cede large strips of land to the central powers. Now, even within the Bolshevik party, people were divided whether or not signing this treaty was a good idea. But also, other revolutionaries, I'm talking about the left SR, the Socialist Revolutionaries, they were against this. They assassinated the German ambassador. And in the summer of 1918, they launched an uprising against the Bolsheviks, which was crushed by pro-Bolshevik forces. Also, that summer, the former Tsar and his family were executed in Yekaterinburg by a Cheka firing squad. According to historian Orlando Fajest, the Red Terror did not come out of the blue. It was implicit in the regime from the start, as Kamyenev and his supporters had warned a party in October, the resort. To rule by terror was bound to follow from Lenin's violent seizure of power and his rejection of democracy. The Bolsheviks were forced to turn increasingly to terror to silence their political critics and subjugate a society they could not control by other means. The direct cause of the Red Terror occurred in September 1918. Interesting enough is that Lenin became a public figure when he was about to die. Before that, many Russians would not recognize him. Because earlier that year, in January 1918, his car was taken under fire with a failed assassination attempt. And after this, he was barely seen in public. But on August 30th, 1918, he visited an arms factory in southern Moscow. When he was about to leave, a young Russian Jewish woman went by the name of Fanny Kaplan, she walked forward. She raised a pistol and fired three shots on Lenin. As Lenin fell to the ground, Kaplan was eventually arrested. She, as a socialist revolutionary, believed that Lenin was a traitor to the revolution. And the left SRs had launched a revolt against the Bolsheviks, which was snuffed out. Lenin was rushed to the hospital, and it seemed he was about to die. However, near the end of September, he recovered. The Bolshevik press explained this as a miracle. Now, who did die in September was Kaplan herself. She was executed by a Cheka firing squad. So what about the Cheka? The Cheka, the old Russian extraordinary commission to combat counter-revolution and sabotage, was the Bolshevik secret police. The Cheka HQ was located in a former Tsarist police building in Petrograd. Later, it moved to Moscow and established its HQ in the Lubyanka building, the former old Russia insurance company building. And by that point, it had around 600 men in its ranks, which soon increased to 1,000. The Cheka was a state within a state, and it stood above the law. An attempt to bring it under the law failed. The Cheka was led by Felix Dzerzinski, and he was a Polish former social democrat. He came from a modest gentry family in the Vilna region. During his teens, he became involved in underground political activity and spent much of his years in Tsarist prisons. 
He was liberated from these prisons in March 1917. Despite being Polish, he rejected Polish nationalism. The Cheka was the ancestor of the later Soviet security systems like the GPU, the NKVD and the KGB. Although not in name, the Cheka can be seen as a successor of the Tsarist secret police, the Okhrana, because it borrowed much of its tactics and techniques. The Chaka was basically channeling the violence, as Jarzinski later stated in 1922. Assuming that the age-old hatred of the revolutionary proletariat for its slave masses will necessarily take the form of a whole series of unsystematic bloody episodes, I have attempted to introduce the systemization of the penal apparatus of revolutionary power. The Cheka has never been anything other than the rational direction of the punishing arm of the revolutionary proletariat. Now what Zierzynski points out here is really interesting because he speaks of an age-old hatred and historian Orlando Feijas, he also talks about this. See, for ages Russia was a society with a lot of poor people, mostly peasants, who had to bow for the rich people, which was a much smaller class. And in memoirs from 1917-18, written by Russian princes, countesses, writers, businessmen, they recalled how they were met with rudeness and hostility by those who previously showed their respect. As Fajas puts it, It was as if the servant class had all along been wearing a mask of goodwill, which had been blown away by the revolution to reveal the real face of hatred below. During the first months after the October Revolution, the Bolshevik regime wasn't as bloody as it later would be. Only 1,000 executions were carried out between December 1917 and the summer of 1918. And this was due to the fact that there were also left SRs in the ranks of the Cheka, which proved to have a moderate effect. But then, when the SRs were ousted after their failed uprising that summer, the Cheka could go all out. Many arrests were random because the Bolsheviks hadn't consolidated their power yet in order to have a well-functioning police state. If you would take a look in the Cheka prison, you would find people from all walks of life, from princes to peasants, from clergymen to laborers. The Red Terror looked similar to Stalin's terror, uh, when it came down to the randomness for the victims. The feared knock on the door at night could occur to everyone. The Bolsheviki, they justified their terror as the war against counter-revolution. But who exactly these counter-revolutionaries were, that was not entirely clear. And as time progressed, the regime became more paranoid. Kaplans could be everywhere. Most of the victims of the Cheka were bourgeois hostages. These were people that were arrested and would be shot as a reprisal once counter-revolutionary activities would occur. Most of these people were innocent and were just unfortunate to be around once an act of sabotage or something like that occurred. The frenzy was the worst outside of the big cities, where local Cheka bosses ran their own kingdoms, so to say, inspired by Lenin's words that it was better to arrest 100 innocents than to let one guilty person go free, they went out of their way to make the most arrests. The randomness of the arrests and the ungroundedness went through the roof. One man was arrested because he possessed a photo of someone in judicial clothing. This photo was from the 1870s. Another person was arrested because he had skipped the line. Actually, he didn't skip the line. No, he saw two other people skipping the line. He called them out for it. And then these two people reported him and he was arrested. And many people were also arrested because of their surname. Those who had a common surname were in the most risk of being arrested. The conditions in the Cheka prisons were often much worse than they had been in the Tsarist prisons. Lack of sanitation and poor food resulted in epidemics. 
The Peter and Paul fortress in Petrograd that stood as a symbol of the horrors of the Tsarist regime was now a worse place to be than it ever had been. Compared to this, the old regime prisons looked like a holiday camp. The torture methods that the Czechists applied were medieval to say the least. Many of the Czech executioners they were confronted with Tsarist oppression in the earlier years and now implemented this on their hapless victims. Others were scarred by years of war and revolution and there were also women in the ranks of the Cheka. There were many sadists among them and they competed with one another who could go the furthest. When I visited the East Ukrainian city of Kharkiv in the summer of 2019, I visited a building which survived the Second World War which used to be a former Cheka HQ. The inhabitants, they told me that victims were thrown down the stairwell head first. And they also told me that once mechanics visited the basement of the building to do some checkups, they found old bloodstains on the wall. Uh, the torture methods that were implemented are outrageous. And, you know, if you want to know them, look them up for yourself. The executions were the final product of this machinery of terror. Tens of thousands of summary executions were carried out in courtyards and cellars or in deserted fields on the edge of towns. As the civil war kicked off, whole prisons were emptied so these people could not be captured alive by the whites. It is hard to say how many people died as a result of the terror by the Cheka. Do we also include um, civilians that were slaughtered by the Red Army during the civil war? According to historian Orlando Fajas, we may never know the exact number of deaths during the Red Terror. The number is most likely in the hundreds, thousands. Some historians even claim over a million people were killed in the Red Terror. The Red Terror led to protests also within the Bolshevik party. Members like Kamienev and Bukharin claimed the Cheka was abusing its power. Yet hardliners as Trotsky, Stalin and Lenin remained firm in their stance that the terror was necessary to make the revolution a success. Stalin would later surpass this. Now many, I call them Lenin apologists or people who think that Lenin was a good guy, claim that Lenin didn't know of the terror and was even against it. Well, Lenin had always accepted the need to use terror in order to defend the revolution. It was a weapon in the civil war. Of course, he was careful to distance himself in public from the institutions of the terror. Others put their signature to his death warrants. And this helped to fuel the myth that Lenin was a good and gentle czar who had nothing to do with the evil actions of his oprishniki. But behind the scenes, Lenin was a stalwart champion of the Red Terror. When moderate Bolshevik party member Kamenev offered to abolish the death penalty and Lenin he heard of this, Lenin flew into a rage and shouted, Nonsense! How can you make a revolution without firing squads? Do you expect to dispose of your enemies by disarming yourself? What other means of repression are there? Prisons who attach significance to that during a civil war? The Red Terror would officially end near the end of 1918, but throughout the civil war, people were killed by the Chaka and the Red Army. And then, speaking of the Civil War, there was also the opponent, the Whites and the White Terror. And all that will be covered in the future. Big shout out to my patrons and a special thanks to Janusz Dajankiewicz, Joan, Justin Trebel, Peter King, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic and Fernando Lopez Ojeda. Hey, if you want to support me, you can also support me via PayPal. The links are in the description. And if you've missed the earlier episodes of Revolutionary Russia, I have the playlist for you is right here. Thank you for watching. Leave a comment and do not forget to subscribe. That's Fedanya.